And we're recording. Great. Okay, we're going to start. Welcome, everybody. It's uh, Friday, June 26, and this is our Feedback Friday, episode 14. So we've been doing this for 14 weeks now, and I just want to welcome everybody and thank you for joining us. Uh, Feedback Friday is Botanical Colors. Uh, weekly, we're, we're practically a TV show now, but our weekly program where we speak with artists, educators, scholars, and all people who are interested in natural dyes. Um, today, well, you know me, I'm Kathy Hattori, and uh, along with Amy Dufo, we're going to be moderating our uh, presentation today. And today, our pres presenter is Zapotec textile artist natural dyer, researcher, and educator, Porfirio Gutierrez. Porfirio is from um, Teotitlan del Valle, Oaxaca, Mexico, and he's known internationally for his dedication to uh, reviving and also maintaining natural dye traditions that are indigenous to his region. So his mission is to reinvigorate and preserve natural dyeing within the Oaxaca area and his work brings the awareness of the profound spiritual belief that nature is a living being sacred and honored. So we're quite, quite excited to have him join us today. Um, before we start, I just wanna say thank you to everyone. As you know, um, your participation and support of Botanical Colors as well as some of the artists that we've um, brought on have just helped immensely and we couldn't do it without you. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. All right, so I think that's pretty much it for um, what we have. Um, we do, I just do wanna talk a little bit about ho housekeeping. Amy is going to be um, monitoring the chat function. And so typically when we have a presentation, we ask you to hold your questions until after the chat. So after the, uh, I'm sorry, after the presentation, hold your chat questions. And uh, Amy will um, open it up after that time and then we'll have a Q&A with Porfirio. So without any further ado, Porfirio, I'd like to introduce you and welcome you to Feedback Friday. And we're very pleased that you'll be able to join us today. Thank you guys for having me. And every, uh, I would like to appreciate everyone who's taking their time to join me. Um, before I get started, I just want to make sure that um, you're able to let people in, Kathy or Amy. It does, something pops out on my end. Um, yeah. Amy is monitoring all the people who are who I'm actively it. admitting people. Uh, I just want to, yeah, okay. I just want to make sure yeah. that. Yeah, we made you um, host, so you're seeing everything. <laughs> <laughs> just disregard all the other things you're seeing. Okay. Chanda, Chandan, Kechinadi Naro, Kechinadi Nabe, Rabe, Basone Diusna, Balash de Yutu. Reciban un cordial saludo de un pueblo ancestral. Teotitlan del Valle, Lugar de los Dioses. Please receive greetings from an ancestral community, Teotitlan del Valle, the place of gods. It is always an honor to have an opportunity to share my work with all of you. Again, thank you all for making the time and joining me. I am um, from, um, okay, wait a minute here. Mm, I just had the earthquake. There. I am uh, again from Oaxaca, Mexico. Oaxaca, it's in the uh, about 200 miles southeast of Mexico City. We are um, it, within Oaxaca, see, uh, the state of Oaxaca is Teotitlan del Valle. In Teotitlan, it's about 200 miles, uh, about, um, I don't know, uh, 30 minutes or so east of the uh, capital city. Um, I am honored, and I will say I am blessed to uh, be inherit this rich culture. The Zapotec people um, established thousands of years ago in Mesoamerica. 
and uh, I am direct descendant for from these people. They, um, oh boy, I'm having a problem with. They, um, some of the remnants, as we saw in the previous picture, some of the remnants of the uh, original temple of the, uh, that you see in Mitla, just uh, very close to my community. And the Zapotec people develop um, a writing system, mathematic. They worked on gold, um, and a lot of their, their history was documented through, uh, through the ceramics. Our heritage come directly from, from, from the Zapotec people and even, or the, our ancestors. And even uh, today we live in syncreti syncretism, our life. Um, it is a, a mix of the influence from what the Spanish brought to us and uh, our ancestors, uh, you know, their way of life and the worldview that had been developed all these thousands of years. You can still see it in our everyday life and in our, in our ceremonies. Um, we honor our loved ones that has passed and we believe that their soul goes to live, their soul goes and live in a spiritual world and they come back and visit us for Dia de los Muertos. We burn incense, we honor them with food, we dance for, our, um, the, for the greater being and um, the light symbol, it is something very important within our um, milestone of our lives. Uh, the food, it is something that, um, especially the corn has been begin to cultivate it in Oaxaca area at least 6,000 years ago. The weaving, it is in, deeply embedded within, within our culture and our life. I was born within this tradition and as I learn how to speak um, our language, I begin to also be learning um, the weaving and the farming and other ways of life. It is when you are born within um, a culture that is deeply rooted in these traditions, it is something that comes naturally, something that you get to learn. Um, again, just as you learn your language. I am direct descendant from uh, the, the weavers and dyers and um, Within my family, this tradition gets passed down from generation after generation. And uh, my teachers, who are my parents, Amado, uh, Gutierrez, and Andrea, are the people who I'm, whom I'm learning from, from. Not only the art of weaving, but also the knowledge and wisdom that their generation still holds. And um, these are these are the people that that I um, not only admire but that I call my my teacher or my first teachers. I would say um, at a very young age, uh, my parents would take us up in the mountains to collect uh, the different plants and herbs that we needed for making our dyes, and uh, almost like a uh, pilgrimage, we'll hike up onto the mountains. And uh, my parents would tell us where the certain plants are grown, what are the colors that they'll give us, how to, um, how to identify the different plants, the name of the plants and so forth. And uh, something that it's uh, later on in life I became much more mindful about is the, um, that he would always say that the plants are alive just like us and to have to, to respect them, to say don't, don't cut a tree just, just to cut a tree. You know, if you're cutting a tree, it's because you're using it to either die, to either build your home. It is something um, very um, sacred to them. Um, these are the stories that they learn from his parents, from their parents and their, their great grandparents and so forth. And um, at that moment, I didn't really understand uh, the whole, the, the, the whole um, information in these and the soul of, of the information that what they were sharing to me. Much later in life, I become mindful of the spiritual aspect and the meanings um, within the words that they were sharing with us. I begin to understand at a very young age 
that much of our food or all the food we, eat, we ate or we eat is within the land we live in. The homes uh, were made with you know, the trees or the branches uh, within our mountains. A lot of the medicine, or in fact, all the medicine, the traditional medicine comes from the land. When I was maybe around nine years old, I became a shepherd up until around 11, maybe 12, when I started weaving. So I was in the mountains every day, basically, every day. I started to learn, I, I, I learned to uh, live uh, in harmony and, and honor the land and the mountains, read nature at a very young age. And I became mindful that nature or the world, I am part of the world. I don't own the world. Instead, I am part of it. And I think those are um, really important things. Uh, later on, it became extremely important in my life. Um, it's just to continue honor Mother Nature through the everyday life. I started to weave formally when I was 12 years old. And uh, being, a, 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 you being young, and like I said earlier, ever since you, you are born, you are part of these practices and helping one way or other to create each piece. Uh, when I was growing up, the toys, it was the tools that was used to make a weaving. That, that was our toys. Um, when, when a young child, all the bobbins that it's used to, uh, to weave, um, that's, that's what the kids will play. Or um, um, I remember uh, growing up too, that I'll use one of the looms as my bed to put all the petals and uh, put it under the loom. So our life, it's deeply embedded within the weaving process itself. When I was 18 years old, I had a, um, a silent time where I migrated to United States in California. And within the States, I, my life was involved on anything other than weaving or the arts. So I was extremely detached, I was completely detached to this art form and these ways of life. And it took me a while to get back home. It took me about almost 10 years to get back home. And when I, when I arrived home, I became extremely, um, uh, first of all, the culture shock was really, um, really tough on me for for a few weeks, but I, with time I began to uh, be mindful of where I was and, uh, and the importance of the, uh, the knowledge, the wisdom, the food, the culture aspect of things. And I could say I had a, an epiphany. I, I became mindful, you know, how much I was, I was losing by me being away. And by, by me being away, it, it gave me the, the, uh, the time for me to, to think about or for me to revalue um, about everything that I grew up with, which I was never um, really mindful uh, completely all about it until I stepped aside for a mid number of years. I began to notice that um, the weaving tradition became uh, such a commercialized and mass produced um, since I was really young, I've seen my parents dying with natural elements um, and insect as, as cochin, such as cochineal. But I didn't know anyone else that was using natural dye, uh, all chemical dyes um, and mass produced weavings. So I became, to, I became really um, sensitive about that. But most importantly, I discovered that I had a passion for weaving, which I didn't know I had. Um, I often say that I, I, I weave because I learned from my parents, it's because, and, and because I, I, I was born within the tradition. 
but that is not the only reason why I do what I do today. The reason for that, it's because I discover my calling. It was easier for me to get back to the to to United States and continue working with other opportunities that the uh, the country has to offer. Or it was easier for me to go back to my community and be part of these mass making and chemical dye weavings and export them that way. But what makes what made a difference for me it was because I discovered that calling. And to me that makes a huge difference because I now have a reason uh, to do this. I, um, I talked to my parents uh, who were already at that time in their early 60s or so that I wanted to reconnect with the weaving, that I wanted to resume the weaving process, but I wanted to create an honor work that truly honors the memories of the ancestors. And it's using completely all natural dye and as well as uh, to create a, uh, a specific language as an artist, which it was difficult for me because when you are born within this tradition, in many ways, your mind, it's sort of in a box where you are tend to repeat designs and repeat everything that, you know, the forefathers and the, um, my grandparents and so forth did, which there's nothing wrong with that. But what I wanted to create is something that's very personal. I began working with my parents, um, and but since there are, you know, at that age they were getting tired. I um, I had a meeting with my eleven siblings, and uh, I told them my passion and what is it that I wanted to do. And Juana, my sister, and her husband Antonio were the one that um, um, was interested in supporting me and has been with me since then. The natural dye tradition and, and, the, and the technique, um, it, 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 it was almost lost at one point. What we've learned from my parents were the basic, about 10 or 12 different colors. Historic uh, pieces that was used or that was done, and even in my parents' work, um, it was mainly um, natural sheep color, and then natural dye complement them. So there was very few colors that was used historically. And um, we began at that point to do research within the community, to actually research with, with the plants, what are the reaction of the plants beyond what we've learned from our parents and also outside of my community to understand about what are the process. My parents used uh, clay to dye their yarn, which then obviously gonna create a different reaction on the colors. And for us, we begin to use clay, but also a lot of the more modern um, materials, as you can see here on the pictures, like alum, uh, stainless steel, and so forth, to create a chemical reaction with the colors. And uh, since then, you know, after about 18, 19 years now, we have been uh, able to um, document about 200 or so different colors, uh, all from natural dye, which obviously we don't use all the 200 colors, but these are some of the colors that we'll be able to, to obtain with just different colors that you see, um, or you, you could find within an environment and in, in our region. I begin to um, became uh, fascinated specifically with cochineal insects. One of the stories that I hear from my mother uh, is um, when, for, for the cochineal insect, it, it actually has to be harvested, it actually has to be farmed to yield the much more richer um, colors. But within our environment, in, in, in our community, you'll see in, um, infestation of cochineal insect around us. And one of the stories I hear from my elder brother, who is 55 years old now, when he was young, my mother would send them to collect some of those wild cochineal insects and, and, and get colored that way. And my mother would grind them directly um, from collecting on the plant, um, meaning that it was never tried. And, um, and remember, they were dying maybe one skein or two skeins of color at that point because they were just um, mix it 
uh, on the design with the natural sheep colors. And uh, I begin to um, be mindful about it, obviously, seeing my parents how they would use it, but also up on the, out on the wild so that you see the cactus being infested with this insect. And um, so these are female insect that grows on uh, prickly pear cactus. It takes about 60 to 70,000 insects to make just one pound of dye stuff. Um, in our studio, we harvest a very small amount, but there's families uh, in the area that um, devoted their life that, to produce and grow cochineal insect. We, we um, scrape them off with a little you know, stick or something to scrape it off. Um, they're alive, or they are, um, um, they, they, their lifespan is about two months or so forth. We notice that the um, much cl uh, colder climate slows their growth, and sometimes they, it'll take about three months for them to become uh, mature. And um, the, um, my understanding that the, the, the farm cochineal insect, it has about 25% of carminic acid in them versus a wild insect that only has about 10%. So there's, um, it has to uh, be farmed so you could get the best dye possible. We collect them and we set them out to dehydrate, but we also um, infest the babies into the new prickly pear cactus. Um, later on my, um, on my presentation, I have a small video that shows the, how we infest the, the prickly pear cactus. So this is um, some of the cochineal that you see that it's already um, dehydrated and ready to be used. To, to um, grind the insect, um, we still use the traditional metate. Uh, it's um, a grinding stone that it's used for to grind food mainly. Um, in this case, we also use it for uh, to grind our dyeing materials. Um, the tricky thing about the cochineal insect and how you grind it, it has to be grind extremely fine, um, so that way you don't you don't waste as much. Um, you know, for us, this is precious, and it's just like any other dye element. Uh, these are these are precious to us, so. You don't want to waste um, a lot of it. So this is the key. When you grind it, it has to grind extremely fine. And you go, you pass, uh, meaning uh, you grind it, you put a, a small amount uh, right behind uh, Juana's hand, as you guys can see there, or behind the, the mano, or, uh, where, or uh, the, the, the part that she's grabbing, that's called that what we call the mano. And you pass, you're grinding through, as, um, as she's rubbing the mano onto the stone. You do that about six times, eight times to have a, 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 a fine uh, cochineal. Obviously, you, you see the reaction with different uh, materials that it's being used, such as stainless steel, um, to either, uh, to dye and to create a, a reaction. Um, also over dye, like with pericone, um, pericon is it is a plant, a wild plant that provides us the yellows, and um, use a, a cheesecloth to to filter the cochineal insect. I begin to um, be extremely interested about it, and as I continue to to um, reconnect with my cultural identity, um, understanding uh, how you you come about to create this color red was extremely fascinating and how it is just from this uh, small insect, um, you could create the, the, and a huge array of different color was, um, was something that truly fascinated me. So I began to not only within the community understanding uh, how the color red has been used, uh, you know, in the last, you know, maybe a hundred years, but how is that was also being used historically? So the color red itself has been an important symbolic element in ancient Mexico. Has been used for uh, different ceremonies, especially for burials. 
It is used um, also as medicine. Um, some of the most important um, elements for color in ancient Mexico is cinabrio and, uh, and of course, cochineal insect, which um, we've learned, we've, we've heard so much about how, you know, it was, you know, a color, a pre preference color when the uh, colonization um, came in, in our area in Mexico. Um, a lot of the things that um, we, we do, um, we might know specific meaning um, why it's done. Um, if you ask one of the elders <clears throat> why we use red, and the answer I got from, from, uh, from this was, um, we don't know the specific reason why the color red is used in some of the ceremonies, because a lot of information um, was taken away from us through the colonization. But we do know that it is important to us because those are the memories of the ancestors. So even through the colonization and, and, the, and the effort uh, to erase our memories, it is impossible for that to happen because these are some of the things that still connect us. And subconsciously, we do things and that's because the memories are still alive through us. So this is um, a ceremony that happens three to four times a year, depending um, the dates. Uh, these are women that wear specifically red garments, red sash, and go through a, uh, through a procession in part, on certain streets within our community. And um, this makes me um, uh, understand, or this gives me an understanding that, that the color red, um, it was something that it was extremely important within ancient Mexico because it is still alive and it's still used today, which obviously begins to create um, an inspiration for me to, uh, to create and to embed within, within my work. This particular piece here, I, um, the title, I title it uh, Corn, the Sacred Plant, because um, this is something to, um, to, to, I like to, to talk about because um, the um, Monsanto has been um, coming to Oaxaca. This happened a few years ago where they wanted to um, introduce their seed in one of the place or maybe the place where corn was originated 6,000 years ago. So this is, these designs represents um, how um, the, the, their indigenous seed, it's been, um, how do I say it? It's been disrespected or it's been, it's in danger and it's been falling from the corn, which is the, 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 the main design up on top that represents, or for me, that represents the sacred seed. Um, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't know much more about this design, the influence of the Saltillo Sarape. It's, it's a particular style of weaving that was created um, with the colonization and indigenous weavers in Mexico. Uh, for me, I'm not paying attention here, maybe where the influence of the design came from instead I'm reclaiming my culture and I'm sharing um, the, the, um, my way of honoring my ancestors through this particular element. And specifically the color, how the color today, it's still alive and the importance of the color for me here for the, you know, the cochineal insect. This is another design that it's inspired on in a series of work that I did that's called uh, rituals. It's inspired on these particular mats that's called petate and these uh, mats was used in um, different ceremonies and also for everyday life. Um, many generations ago it was still used as a shroud. It is made with palm leaves and I was really drawn to the movement of the designs and the movement of colors that the mat would do 
and, and depending how uh, leaves was exposed to the sun, some of them might be much more darker, some of them might be much more lighter. So when a, a piece was made, you'll see some of these variation naturally we begin to create on the mats. So I was really drawn to that and I wanted to honor that particular mat with, with the cochineal, the different shades of cochineal. In these particular pieces, I begin to explore not only um, these movements of colors, but also using a uh, fiber plant. This is uh, made wool and plant fiber. This particular um, body of work was shown in the textile museum in Oaxaca City a few years ago as an installation. And the silhouette you see on the, on the wall there um, helps to depict how these pieces were made uh, in different ceremonies, maybe um, to kneel on when someone gets married to receive lessons from, community, from the community, as well as um, to grind food. This is a direct shot of the piece that you see. So um, I was, I, again, I'm, I'm really drawn to these spaces or to the movement of, of the materials itself. This is also it's done with plant fiber and of course with indigo. Um, it is a much of basket weave like, um, as you can see the mats. Um, so I was really drawn to just also a space of that and I just honored the plant fiber, indigo and cochineal insect in this particular piece. Uh, this is also um, a design that it's much more closer to the original designs of today that you see on the petate. Other designs as such as fragments, which um, I mentioned earlier, uh, these are the designs that was inspired on uh, the um, Saltillo Sarapes, uh, this uh, technique or this type of work that was developed on the merging of the, you know, the two, two cultures, indigenous and the European. But specifically here, I wanted to honor not only the elements, but also the weavers, the indigenous weavers who was obviously subject to sla slavery and um, to either, um, for me, it was to honor them as, you know, to honor their, their, their um, artistic expression. And, and uh, this particular design became an important symbolic as cloth for Mexico overall. So this is a straight shot of one of these designs and, and the imagery of butterflies, which is really important to us. Butterflies represent an underworld, um, the spirit world, earthly world through the journey of underworld into the spirit world. This is another design that um, I'm really drawn to these specific spaces. So this particular piece I call the celestial space. So the, the left side of the design that's, to me, that represents the celestial space and um, all the dots that you see around it represents the sacred seed, which are corn, beans, and squash, and also lit candles, um, the candle that it's, we use in different um, events and ceremony events within the community. This is another design. This is are referred to as the offerings. And it just kind of reminds me of all the ofrendas or all the offerings we put on the altar um, through um, or for day of the dead. It's either, you know, the fruit, the incense, the candles and so forth. This, now this body of work, uh, my reference to it, it's the journey. This is, um, it's drawn by the very traditional designs that you would see uh, um, inspired on the walls of Mitla, the archeological site nearby Teotitlan. Um, and, and this is much more, a lot of my work, as you guys can see, and much more simplified, much more um, bold and used two or three different colors on them. This is uh, the, butter, the butterfly design, mainly uh, for those of you that might know some of the you know, traditional designs in, uh, from Oaxaca or Teotitlan. It is, a lot of it are bands, are, are bands of different, elements that you see going across, or maybe you see a center piece or center diamond um, with some of the design on each end. 
in this case, I wanted to completely break off from that. Um, I wanted to reinterpret, you know, what my father or my grandparents did, and I wanted just to um, to 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 retell the story and uh, create these, use the same elements and the same designs, and um, and, and and spread perhaps or present the design in a total different way. And and I'm really happy with how this design came out. This particular design was dyed the background with tree moss. Um, indigo, it's really hard to see. They're over dyed with pericorn and a little bit of marush. This is um, a, a design that is inspired on the archaeological site and it's done completely with uh, plant fiber. The ixle, for those of you that has been in Oaxaca, um, ixle, that's where, or the agave fiber, that's where the mezcal comes from. So the leaves of the, um, of, of the agave um, it is obviously, it goes to waste after it's being harvested. So all the fibers within the leaves, um, it's being um, hand, um, spun by hand. And that's how this piece came about and was created. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Um, Porfirio, can you um, unshare the screen so we can? And we're going to open up um, the chat. I've been seeing people furiously writing, taking <laughs> notes. Let me see here. Um, I think I just opened it. Did I not? Somebody write a question. I didn't know. Um, Open. If, okay, uh, great. <laughs> I, I didn't know that um, ner um, I was much more nervous being in front of a computer than actually being in front of people at a, a, at a presentation. So this is all new to me. <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful. Now, um, I. As, can you guys see Porfirio right now? Oh, there. <laughs> I'm like, am I go is my computer going crazy here? Um, nothing to be nervous about because these are all really great people here who yeah. are just want to ask and learn and, and just be together. So um, I guess we will just jump into some questions. I'm, I'm going to start with one that there's a bunch of questions that came in through email. So uh, the first one was, how does knowledge in your community pass from one generation to the other? What happens with the new generations? Are they willing to keep your amazing job going? Um, it is obviously becoming very difficult because of the lifestyle. It's not as, as, as maybe, let's say, for instance, my generation. Um, 
there was obviously influences there and it, <clears throat> the influences, much more hardened influences begin to arrive late 60s, early 70s when a more commercial market begin to develop. Then you start to see much more economic opportunity within the community. Um, so there start to be a lot more options. When I was growing up, our life was much more embedded within the traditional way of life. And you learn it and that's how you live. You, that's what you learn. That's what you see, um, what your grandparents or your parents do every day. Now, you don't see that a lot. Now, kids are gone up and gone into uh, maybe, you know, school and wants to be a doctor. They don't want to really be a weaver anymore. And a lot of it, too, because um, <clears throat> the parents, <clears throat> because uh, uh, there's starting to be a big disconnection. And, and sometimes us as our parents won't do a good job where we, we, we tell our kids, you know, go to school so you could be a doctor, so you could be a doctor or lawyer and you could get an education and you won't suffer like me farming or weaving. So those are the things that it's obviously it's and of course the the um, um, the influence the oppression and that we wanted to you know be um, someone important like you know a lawyer which we're not thinking sometime that you know or, or at least for me personally um, I think we even in dying it's important and it's equally um, valuable as if it were a lawyer so um, you see a lot of a lot of these um, reasons why these inf these uh, traditions, unfortunately, not being passed down anymore as we used to see. One of the things you talked about during your presentation, somebody's asking a question about it. It struck me too um, about Monsanto coming and trying to sell seed there. But um, somebody was asking about how are you combating that with Monsanto trying to come in and kind of lead people um, away from traditional ways of farming? One of the things that it's really important, and before I can answer that, is um, um, why this is important to me and for many of us in Oaxaca, of course, and around the world, the, the indigenous seeds and the food that we eat. It is that um, when I was growing up, um, my, my, uh, my dad, when he harvests, he would pick the, the most beautiful and the biggest corn uh, corn on, on the cob and puts them on the altar. Um, I knew what that what he meant with that by put them in the altar, but I asked him one day why he puts the corn on the altar. And he said, these are sacred food. This is one of the reasons that our nation survived over thousands of years. And this is a life source for us. And uh, we uh, reason why uh, he said reason why I put them on the altar is to um, give thanks to the greater being. Growing up, I will never and never see or I never saw a kernel on the floor or a piece of tortilla on the floor. My dad will always say if, if he sees us wasting food or wasting the tortillas and he say, can you see this, this, the sky is clear, meaning there's no rain. Um, and that is, it is absolutely clear to me that this is sacred, uh, especially the corn, the squash, and beans. When Monsanto arrived in Oaxaca, um, I don't know, this has been at least, I don't know, maybe eight years ago, and they wanted to introduce and push their seeds. So many artists, specific, um, and, and uh, specifically Maestro Francisco Toledo, who, who passed a few years ago, begin to fight against that and along with other uh, people that, that really cares for our culture there in Oaxaca and was able to push them back for now. So we don't have that, but that threat, it's obviously, it's always there. But um, I think w what I could see as a personal opinion is for us to continue using the indigenous seed and to continue cultivating our land as much as we can. Um, kind of going from where, where you've come from and inspiration from, from your mother and father, one of the things you talked about, and there was a question that came in, so I'm kind of combining things here, but where you were really inspired by your parents, kind of maybe your first inspiration, but you want to do something different than what they did. How are you, how are you taking your current kind of current themes 
and getting inspired by it and, and kind of merging those older, older traditions. Is there, is well, it just sort of the artist in you that's, that's doing something that's different from your parents? Um, well, um, I must say that, um, <clears throat> obviously, and it's evident that, that my background is weaving and, and because that's what I've learned and that's what people know within the, within the art community. But I must say that <clears throat> I come from a background of ceremonial dancers and musicians. Um, some of my family are still musicians. Um, in my family, we are still musicians even now. And with the ceremonial dancing, uh, Danza de la Pluma, um, it is still happening, um, obviously, within our community. And uh, some of my family member and my, uh, our, um, our, you know, great, our, our grandparents um, was also a, um, a maestro de la danza. So um, the weaving, as I said earlier, it was, it was given to us automatically. And, um, and when I think about where some of these uh, inspiration might come and, and why these, um, uh, my brain to, to really think about, um, you know, or, or my approach on the design, I would say, I think it's a little bit of, of those things, you know, the musician background or the ceremonial dancing, um, and of course the weaving, you know, and what my parents have done in the past. Um, um, I think for me, beyond just the design itself, uh, my inspiration, it comes from my parents as human, as, as I feel that I'm very fortunate and very inspired to show, um, you know, my parents and to be proud of what they've done and who they are, um, but also to, uh, to show that in a perspective as um, an, an, an artistic perspective to uplift what they've done. And, uh, and to hopefully show the work that it's done, um, that hopefully the work that I'm doing could be shown in an art uh, setting, um, not, more, not much more of a lo lower, um, lower art form as it has been seen. So all these things are my inspiration. And as, as for the design specifically, um, it is very difficult to explain um, how these designs come about and how my brain process them. It is obviously there's a, an influence from uh, me as a contemporary or uh, a Zapotec artist that it's alive today, um, that I travel back and forth from a much more contemporary world into a much more traditional way of life and growing up. So those two things, I think it, it, it helps in enriching each other and, and, and my brain process certain of the designs in a very specific way that, you know, it's, again, it's really difficult to, to explain that, but it's just honoring. I think it's important for me to always honor uh, my parents, my forefathers and my ancestors to what I'm doing. Yeah. This uh, Petra Holmberg is uh, just put in the chat here. Your work is kind of rhythmic or moving, I think like music or dance. I'm I had just written down too the musicality of weaving. Thank this you. kind of you're hearing the music and you're you're kind of the movement of the weaving and the you know the history of the dyes. It is like a little like a symphony that's happening. I Thank guess. You. Yeah. Um, because we're because we are running out of time, and I want to make sure you talk about this. Um, can you talk more about that garden that you're? I know you're you're it's on hold a little bit, but kind of the educational educational center and the tintorial garden. That you're yeah, um, for, for a long time, I have been, um, you know, seeing obviously, you know, how you could actually be more sustainable um, to not only take Mother Earth to to only take from Mother Earth what you to only take what you need from Mother Earth, but also how we could at least grow some of our diet plant. It's obviously you see the problem with climate change. You see, you know, you know the the difficulty that you know a lot of uh, indigenous. Um, artists that it's been or people that work with the land that's been facing right now so um, I do you know I was blessed to be able to acquire a piece of land a few years ago and the idea is to plant some of the uh, some of the plants that we use or if not all but at least um, enough of it so we don't take more enough from from the nature but also so that way we could have 
a way to um, irrigate them, to water them, and have them available. So those are some of the things that I, I have been, um, you know, thinking about doing. And of course, you know, there's there's a lot more that I could be done with it that I could hopefully, you know, um, inspire other, you know, gener or the younger generation within the community. But obviously, with all these uncertain things happens, a lot of these things, you know, it's it's not within our hands. And for me, at least right now, at least what I could hope for is to at least being able to farm food on it, you know. Um, um, Kip Inglis just wrote a, a really good question and she said, can we have a list of the plants that you use? I mean, if, it, if we can, so it, when we email everybody later, we can, we have kind of a list of resources. So we can get that from you, like just, or is it maybe on your website right now? Like, yeah, there's a few things on my website. You guys can visit my website, it's Porfirio Gutierrez, yes. I think there's some other things on your website too that are available right now. There is, <laughs> there is a couple of different things. Um, one of the things that I was um, just explaining to uh, Kathy and Amy a few days ago um, is that uh, unfortunately I shut down my production in Oaxaca. Uh, my brother-in-law, Antonio, who you saw in the video, um, is uh, going through COVID right now. And he's doing much better, but he was uh, really battling with his life few uh, weeks ago so I obviously had to shut down production so um, I was able to make a few pieces available that I have with me here in California on my website right now and they, they, that's basically all the things that I have a few pieces on there uh, until you know hopefully you soon get better and uh, all these things could be over and we could resume production again. Mm -hmm. And um, somebody was asking about how to best support you right now. And we did put up a donation page alongside Abu Bakar Fofana, who's also on there too, and who's I'm staring at right now, who's here on Zoom with us. But so we have um, both, both um, artists are up there, so you can support Abu Bakar's farm and you can um, support Porfirio's, everything that's happening with with his uh, dye studio. And I know Khabibi's on here too, Khabibi Ajanku. And we're going to make it so you can actually see her, her page too for donations, but she's also on there. So we're really trying to help support everybody right now who's going through challenging times because of coronavirus. And for all of you who are writing all these beautiful comments about how inspired you are about this presentation, it's a really great opportunity to, to go support Porfirio and Abu Bakar and Khabibi. Uh, Kathy, did you want to add something in here? Because I know we're getting closer to the. Did I forget anything at all? No, we're good. We're good. Thank you, everyone. This is great. Yeah, just to um, emphasize, we do have um, two donation pages on the Botanical Colors website. Uh, and we're going to add a third for Kibibi Ajanku, who spoke last week for um, Juneteenth. But also um, Porfirio's website, which is porfiriogutierrez.com, and we'll, we'll have that spelled out for you, um, has absolutely beautiful work on it. And there are pieces that look like they're available. Is that correct, Porfirio? Yeah, there's some pieces that I was able to, to make available or finish yeah well we shut down the studio so you can see them on the website so those are available to order and are you going to be able to send them from um um where you are or are they coming from oaxaca no i have them with me in california so be shipped them from there from yeah. california so, you know they're available i would highly encourage you to have a look at them they're just amazing amazing work um, the other thing that we thought we'd do with Porfirio, as we've done with Abu Bakar, is to um, sponsor some classes. So Porfirio and I are talking about that, and we should have those announced shortly. Um, so look for those. That's a great opportunity to really learn more in depth. There's a lot of questions about technique in the chat, and um, definitely we can go through a lot of that detail um, that I think you'll find immensely interesting and, and wonderful. And um, what else? I think that's it. Any last minute questions that 
Porfirio can answer? Um, you know, Porfirio, when you, when you go back to watch this, you just have to look at the chat box and how many people are just so <laughs> enamored with your, your presentation and what you're doing. I mean, there's not many questions coming in as much as people just, are, are, just love the presentation. They're inspired. They want to know when they can visit. They want to, you know, get involved. They want to support. So, Thank you. so you have to read these after because they're a lot of great people. Yeah. Um, so I think without any further ado, we're going to um, say goodbye. But before we do that, we'll unmute. Um, also for next week, which would be July 3rd, we are taking that day off. We get a day off finally. Hell yeah. Sorry. <laughs> It's, it's, been a, it's been a real independence for, for us, Kathy. I no. know. So we off, um, and oh. we'll be back the following week, which will be the 10th. And Amy, you already have a guest, but we're, um, we'll announce it next week. Yeah, so. we have the next two months planned out. And you guys are going to get your minds blown. If this hasn't already just blown your mind this month, get ready. Yeah, people, we're getting some really amazing people to um, come on and chat with all of you. It's just been really lovely. So we're so excited about that. Uh, so let's go ahead and unmute. Thank you, everybody, of course. Thank you so much. And say Thank hello you. and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great Thank you. 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 Oh, no. Hi. So grateful. <laughs> Hi. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Wonderful. Hi, Kabibi. Hello. Hi, Kabibi. Hello. <laughs> we're getting your donation up. We have to switch it out, what we're doing for you. Yep. Yeah. We'll right. get those kids, get those kids to that you. camp. We're, we're, we're there. Are, pumped and ready to receive us up there and ready to go from down here. So Excellent. yeah. Okay. Hi Katrina. Hi Gail. This has been a really great botanical colors week. I've been with you guys every day almost. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've loved it. I've been loving it. Oh good. Yeah. Yeah. good. A great, I'll miss great you next group week. of people. <laughs> I'll good. miss you next week. Oh, All right, bye-bye. Uh, so you'll be with bye, us. Could be. All right. Hey, Katrina, I see you. Hi, sweetie. Thank you, guys. This is amazing. Oh, thank you, Katrina. Thank you. Hi, hi Kathy. Hi, Bree Sonicut. Hi, Amy. Hi, <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Sal. Gracias. Bye, everybody. Thank you. For thank you. Yeah, you. Abu Bakar. Yeah. Bye, Abu Bakar. <laughs> wow, what a Kathy Green. Kathy Green. 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 <laughs> Susanna, how are you? Let's see. Got all the regulars, I can see. Thank you. <laughs> this is Alexandra. Yeah. Uh, thanks, guys. That was awesome. Thank you. I'm so happy that I'm seeing some of the names of people who are having a hard time getting on here. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. great. Hola, Susana. Hola, hermoso. Trabajo de Porfirio. Una maravilla. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias. 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 Una maravilla desde Perú, Porfirio. Oh, Te mando gracias. saludos grandes. Gracias, saludos para ustedes. Gracias. Gracias. This is so great. Oh, Kathy, you're still recording. Oh, Porfirio. Oh, Can Porfirio, you you're in charge. That's right. And where it says record, hit the stop. <laughs> the best.